Twisted Metal Black is a game that, like Onions and Ogres, has layers. On its surface, it's a fast-paced, action-packed arena fighting game. Going a little deeper, it's also a mysterious, brooding world that's brilliant in its darkness and features a cast of characters whose stories I find to be endlessly fascinating. Those characters are what I would like to explore today. I'll go through each one and try to break down what they're all about and their place in the world of Twisted Metal Black. And in addition to that, what they could represent in the larger meta-narrative of this game. And what I mean by that is, for those who are unaware, Twisted Metal Black hides a major twist that's revealed only when you progress through the game as Minion, which you could unlock after beating the game with every other playable character. Where everyone else has this inner monologue that displays during the loading screen, Minion presents a series of coded messages that, when translated, read, I do not think this is real. I must speak in code or he will discover me. We are trapped in his head. This is how he sees the world, how Sweet Tooth sees his life. It is not real. All of us are trapped in his head. I miss the old colorful world. We will return to our world one day. In the real world, my name is Marcus Kane. These messages completely flip on its head how we understand Black and its world. This game may not be just a dark adaptation of the old Twisted Metal, like slapping a sinister coat of paint on a beloved and familiar franchise just for shock value. This world is a specific brand of darkness. It's the representation of a twisted, broken psyche inside the mind of a serial killer clown. Every character afflicted with the dark disease, every environment crumbling under the weight of unchecked evil, every ounce of chaos is the result of Needles Kane taking the reins away from Marcus to fully commandeer Sweet Tooth. Depending on your interpretation, either Needles is projecting his own dark perception onto the world around him as an elaborate hallucination, or he is imagining the world of Twisted Metal Black in its entirety. I do think that what we see in Black is the quote, real world but put through the filter of Needles and his dark disease. It bends and twists reality to fit his perception of the world. No one sees reality as it truly is. We are all forced to see reality through our own unique veil of perception. That is a combination of input through our senses and in our own minds filtering that input. But it's never a perfect one-to-one -one representation of reality. The veil always adds this layer of separation, and for some, that layer is thin and hardly noticeable, while others, like needles, have dark, thick veils that create so much separation from reality that only bits and pieces of it manage to sneak through the gaps. Needles fills in those blind spots with his own disturbing madness, the madness that makes up Twisted Metal Black. This game is how Sweet Tooth sees the world, and the implications are really infinite. Everything in the game is subject to interpretation, that every character is a representation of something inside the mind of Needles, a Sweet Tooth. So as I cover each character and their stories as the game presents them, I'll also add in what I think their appearance could represent inside Needles' mind. So with that, let's descend into madness. Let's explore. Twisted Metal Black. Hello, it's me once again, the Twisted Metal 2012 announcer, here to tell you that you clicked on this video. Subscribe to Drew Desidu, or I'll take every utensil you own and replace it with the grabby claw thing from arcades. Have fun eating your cereal, as no matter how hard you try, each frosted flake slips the grasp of the claw. First off, we have Junkyard Dog. Everything hurt. My face, my mind. My heart. Billy Ray Stilwell is the driver of Junkyard Dog, a beat up old tow truck that at one point served as his companion on occasional nights and weekends where he would patrol the rural highways of his area, rescuing stranded motorists for a little extra money on the side. But that was back when his life made sense. By the events of Swiss to Metal Black, we know Billy Ray as our broken hearted farmer of simple, haunted disposition. A man who was disfigured and mentally shattered by a cheating wife and a crop dusting pilot who conspired to leave him in his own field to wither with the crops and a cloud of poison and betrayal. While walking his field one day, admiring their growth, hoping for a fruitful harvest that was just two weeks away at that point, he noticed a plane buzzing overhead. Alarmed, as he did not have any crop dusting scheduled for that day, he tried to yell to the pilot to stop and let him get out of the way, but his pleading went ignored, and the plane dumped its payload of toxic gas. Billy was suffocated by that cloud and was unconscious for hours. He found his livelihood as a farmer in ruin, and himself turned into a monster. His face was horrifically warped and his mind ground into mush. When he woke up, his first thought was to find his wife Annie. She was smart and she would know what to do. He crawled through the apocalyptic remains of his once bountiful field, only to find Annie in the arms of the pilot who just destroyed his entire existence. Annie and the pilot were kissing and giggling about their plan to kill Billy Ray and use the life insurance money to run away together. Upon reaching his wife and the pilot, 
They were both in utter shock that he somehow survived the attack. The pilot fled immediately, leaving Billy Ray alone with Annie, where he took revenge on the spot. In a brutal slang, he ended her, using a hoe as his ironic tool for the job. Following that, Billy Ray ends up in the Blackfield Asylum with the rest of the contestants, where he sits alone and plagued by nightmares of the pilot who took everything from him, flying around mocking him. He enters a Twisted Metal tournament in the hopes that the pilot will be brought to him so that he can finish his tour of vengeance that started with Annie. His story is a fairly simple revenge plot that to me sort of lacks the depth of other characters, so there really isn't much else to it on its surface. Billy Ray fantasizes about hunting down this pilot and when he wins the contest, he gets exactly that. Calypso offers him the flyboy on a f***ed up silver platter. He rolls the pilot's own plane into him shredding him on the propeller. Billy Ray has come to realize that this whole killing thing was something that he kind of liked doing. Plus, it's not like his farm was a viable option anymore. He sets out into the big city to see what kind of trouble he can get into. It's really only with the meta narrative of seeing what Billy Ray could represent inside the mind of Sweet Tooth that it gets more interesting, in my opinion. To me, Billy Ray could represent Needle's first stroll down the dark path of serial murder. It's my interpretation that Sweet Tooth could have, at one point, just been a mundane man with a simple life perhaps as an ice cream man. Before something in his life, like for example, an unfaithful wife, caused his mind to bend and twist and snap in two. When it snapped, it transformed Needles into an unflinching force of evil and led him to the brutal slaying of his wife. Billy Ray shows how Sweet Tooth might feel like he is this grotesque, physically and mentally scarred monster formed out of the betrayal of someone he trusted and loved. That Marcus and Needles became separate identities because of the pain of that day. When Billy Ray gets his revenge on his wife and the pilot who she conspired with, you know, the people that ruined his life, his face and his mind, he finds that he really enjoys inflicting that same pain onto others and to decides to leave his simple farming life behind. Perhaps it was something similar for Sweet Tooth when he fully embraced the darkness and became the notorious psychotic clown that torments the streets of Midtown. Next up is Preacher. The Lord does work in mysterious ways. Preacher is the driver of Brimstone, a white El Camino whose windows were replaced with stained glass for maximum lack of visibility. As a man of faith and conviction to a higher power, he lets the Lord be his eyes and ears, not only while navigating the darkness of black, but I guess also while driving the sinful streets of Midtown. Preacher's real name is Jebediah, an evangelist traveling from town to town, spreading the word of his religious vision to anyone who wanders within earshot. Due to some ticky-tack centering by the development studio themselves, Preacher must say explicitly that he is not even a real preacher, at least not since the church disowned him or whatever, but that hasn't slowed down his efforts to one day bask in the glory of his Lord once again. Really, if anything, it's only driven him further and harder to be accepted back into the church's good graces. However, his own followers have started to suspect that his pursuits are just a clever disguise for his descent into madness, and that he will eventually find himself entangled with the oppressing blackness of the world he is condemned to exist in, becoming indistinguishable from what he fears most. When you ask the Lord for forgiveness and all you see are obstacles, reasons to quit, it takes a true believer to see that it's all just part of the journey right? Who could blame him for believing a higher power will lift him above the chaos and insanity? Or if you're a preacher, you're asking, who could blame me for anything? His story here begins when a couple joined him at his church. They brought with them their newborn child so that Preacher could exercise their baby from the demon they suspect was possessing it. In his hands, Preacher held evil itself, and so a spiritual battle was waged. Before long, the demon proved even too powerful for someone as devoted and loyal as Preacher, and claimed him as its next host. With the demon in full possession of his mind and body, it left only his spirit inside to cry out for the horror to end. The demon sank its unholy teeth into the depths of his mind, gnawing away on the switches and levers that allow him control over himself. It didn't take long before Preacher killed everyone inside the church and tore it apart. There was power in the demon, giving Preacher the ability to do things he couldn't possibly do on his own. But the demon abandoned his body just as the police arrived, leaving him alone to grapple with what he's done. Despite his pleading of innocence, that he is blameless for the killing, that he was momentarily the vessel of unthinkable evil, no one believed him and he was found guilty. He was taken to Blackfield Asylum where he hopes one day he'll have the opportunity to know the truth about what happened in that church 
so that he can clear his name not only in the eyes of the law, but the eyes of the Lord, so that he can be accepted back into the flock and be ordained once again. Preacher lives in constant fear that the demon will return and inflict even more harm and pain on the people around him, and more importantly, his standing with the Lord. Until one day, Calypso visits him and offers a chance to uncover the truth so long as he competes and wins his tournament. Given no other path to redemption, Preacher agrees. Preacher refers to the demon as a voice on several occasions. I would often hear a voice calling to me from within. You are my chosen one, Jebediah. You are my child, here to do my bidding and it's only through his willpower that he denies that access to control him. On Brimstone's patient bio screen in-game, he is diagnosed with schizophrenia and grandiose delusions. That is borne out through every aspect of his story. That the demon inhabiting him is expressed as a voice in his head speaks to his schizophrenia. That he accepts that he'll have to kill and destroy anything in his way because any means justify the ends to save his soul speaks to his grandiose delusions. Sometimes in its flexibility, the mind forgets which things are real and which things are fake. It doesn't take much to trick a mind, especially when we so desperately want to be tricked. Perception creates reality just as much as reality creates perception. If you want to believe that any wrongdoing on your part was the result of some powerful entity controlling your mind and body, and that you should remain blameless for the damage you've caused, the brain knows better than to stop you. When Preacher wins the contest after wading through hordes and hordes of sweet tooth and f roadkill just absolutely f slapping you into oblivion. My God, it was all... He confronts Calypso, demanding that he remove the demon from his body and clear his name. Because the demon was responsible for the killings, not him, right? Calypso was hesitant to grant the wish as it's asked. Calypso only agrees to uncover the truth, but that doesn't mean it will clear his name. Calypso tells Preacher that the demon isn't real, it's just something he constructed in his imagination. The child that was brought to him for an exorcism was actually meant to be baptized. It was all in his mind. His psyche has been busy twisting and bending reality to reconcile his irredeemable actions with his relentless pursuit for religious salvation. He is mentally unwell unable to interface with reality as it truly is, and so all he can do is fill in the gaps with what he knows best, his religion and beliefs. His violent episode being his fault is a truth he can't handle, so he ends up contextualizing it as a demonic possession. No matter the source of the harm, the pain, the destruction that is caused, in the world of black, it's all just evil by any other name. Infecting and corrupting a new host, incubating in the mind of a man who wants nothing more than to bask in the light of his lord, but is instead cast into the abyss. Preacher tried to seek redemption, to pay a penance to find the light again, but nothing worked. Or maybe it did, but the evil or the demon he cultivated in his mind didn't allow him to realize it. Given no other earthly choice, Preacher throws himself from a building. Be careful what you fear most, because sometimes we become what we fear most. What I think Preacher could represent in the mind of Needles Kane is his feelings towards religion or the idea of using belief to justify horrific behavior. Who's a bigger monster? The man who commits atrocities for fun? Or the man who commits atrocities because he's convinced himself that it's his duty? Or is there no difference and one is just more honest about their intentions? Moving on now to Agent Stone. See. God only has time for those who deserve his mercy. Agent Stone is a driver of Outlaw, which can be confusing since a driver of the same name has appeared in Twisted Metal 1 behind the wheel of Crimson Fury. As far as I can tell, there is no relationship between the two. Agent Stone is a SWAT officer assigned as a sniper since his training revealed that he is an exceptional shot with his rifle. He hails from a long line of law enforcement officers, both his father and uncle were cops, as was their father. Right out of high school, Agent Stone joined the police force. Agent Stone was the sort of officer that saw lethal force as an absolute last resort. That he could turn the lights off on a human being all at once from a distance was a weight he never lost sight of. He valued human life enough as a cop that to take one was always when someone else's was in danger. There was this calculation in every event that dictated that if there needed to be some human cost, he made sure it was the bad guys who paid. So long as his mind was right, his ability to strike made for a powerful asset to the police force and the people of Midtown. Agent Stone prides himself on his ability to hit his target just as much as he does his ability to know which targets to hit and when. In those critical moments, he viewed himself as a guardian angel. His story here begins when, one night, his SWAT unit found themselves with the perfect opportunity to take down a doomsday cult he had been aching to dismantle for months. He had a position overlooking the apartments they were holed up in, locating the targets he needed to clear, 
He was given the green light by a superior, but at that moment, an uncontrollable rage overtook Agent Stone. In an instant, his judgment became clouded and his actions were no longer preceded by rational thought, a dangerous combination for a man holding a deadly weapon. For years and years, Agent Stone has spent clawing and chipping away at the scum and evil that fills the streets of Midtown, like a tiny lantern fighting against a thick, suffocating fog. He may light the area around him, but as soon as he moves along, the darkness pours back in behind him. What point is there to arrest the bad guy only for this corrupted world to just let them walk free a few hours later? The only way to ensure clean stays clean is to banish the dirt from existence. It was this thought that overcame his mind in the moment that changed his life. His rage grew and grew and grew until it crescendoed into a flurry of lead raining down on the apartment building. While he may have ended the lives of the cult members, he also did the same to an innocent family huddled in another room. As someone with pure intentions and an exhaustive desire to act on those intentions, there's no pain greater than realizing that you are responsible for unimaginable loss. Agent Stone decided the only way to end the guilt was to end everything. He couldn't live with the mistake he made. The thought of inhaling even one more breath that that family inside that apartment couldn't because of him was too much to bear. So he took matters into his own hands, but found he didn't have the strength to do it. Agent Stone was taken to Blackfield Asylum as he was deemed no longer fit for duty. He spends his days desperately pleading for redemption, for some way to undo the pain that he's caused. One day he's visited by Calypso, who offers him just that. At the end of the story, Agent Stone is granted his wish, the opportunity to go back to the night his grave mistake was made and do things right. Back in position with a sniper, he is given the green light once again, and this time he makes sure every shot hits its target. In his words, the dirtbags were dropping like flies. He takes a look into the other room to see if the family had survived, and to his ultimate delight, they had. He finally made things right. His mistake was undone and his guilt lifted, but just as the relief washed over him, he is shot in the head by one of the cult members who had somehow survived the attack, killing Agent Stone instantly. As it turns out, to return to the past to fix a grave error, there is a cost. The grave error isn't removed, just transferred. The family got to survive, but it was him who took their place. Resurrection isn't cheap, but for a man with pure intentions, no price is too high. And for a man with pure intentions, he wasn't long for the pitch dark world of Twisted Metal Black. His only choice in this dark world was to either watch as his soul erodes from the unending torrent of rushing blackness, or exit early as a hero, with his soul intact. He made the right choice, or rather the only choice that pure intentions would allow. One thing to note is that in early versions of his story, the reason for his indiscriminate violence was not simple cop rage, a man overcome with anger at the world for allowing the criminal element to take over. No, it was much, much darker. The gang that Agent Stone and a SWAT team were after was not the same nebulous collection of generic bad guys. They were very explicitly described as a white supremacist group. The same awful, unforgivable piles of human garbage that set fire to his childhood home with his parents inside. His rage was not a momentary lack of judgment because bad guys are bad. They were a specific brand of evil that he has a deeply personal and horrific history with. His rage was understood, his actions were believable. It's not a huge surprise that the original version of this story was cut and censored, as the subject matter straight a bit too dark, even for a game like Twisted Metal Black, but I do prefer that darker version. A man traumatized by and brought up in a world where his parents and his innocence were taken from him by a monstrous group of of subhuman trash. It's deeply upsetting, but it's powerful. It's believable. It makes you want to run through a brick wall to give Agent Stone what he wants. I think that Agent Stone could represent Sweet Tooth's thoughts about police or law enforcement, and maybe more specifically their futile efforts to bring chaos to order. While in the line of duty, Agent Stone made a mistake that he can't accept or move on from. He took a life he didn't mean to because he let the world blind him with rage. Now his life can't continue until he writes what he believes to be his greatest wrong. But Sweet Tooth could be using his story to represent the idea that believing things must be made right and perfect to be able to come to terms with reality only leads to failure and disappointment. That the ideas of law and order and justice are just as much inside the minds of man alone as the world of black is inside the mind of Sweet Tooth. And to try to force the universe to sit perfectly balanced on the scales of your personal morality comes at a cost. Agent Stone is Sweet Tooth's lesson in accepting that chaos is the order. No badge nor good intentions can change that. Law is man's way to reason with a universe that was never meant to be reasoned with, and there is no universe less willing to be reasoned with than that of Twisted Metal Black. Next up is Mr. Grimm. He didn't know who I was, but I recognized him. 
I'd been seeing his face in my nightmares for 30 years. Grimm is the driver of, uh, Mr. Grimm. A motorcycle with a sidecar full of instruments of destruction where a person should be, and a skull mounted on the handlebars. Mr. Grimm, the bike, shares many features with its pilot, as Grimm the man is himself shackled with a metaphorical sidecar and a skull to carry on the memory of who should be sitting in it. Mr. Grimm is not the collector of souls as he was in previous Twisted Metal games, but he's crazy enough to bring a motorcycle to a car fight. Mr. Grimm took the armored bike from his commander after seeing them get ripped to shreds by friendly fire. Upon that motorcycle, Mr. Grimm arms himself with a powerful scythe that was once used to harvest the fields of Vietnam, but is now a tool in the trade of kicking ass. Mr. Grimm's story begins in 1971. Just 18 years old, him and his best friend Benny were shipped off to fight in the Vietnam War. It was during one of those battles that Benny was shot and gravely wounded. Mr. Grimm stopped to treat him, giving a Vietnamese soldier the chance to capture the duo. Mr. Grimm and Benny were taken to the Vietnamese base and placed at the bottom of a 25-foot hole to be held as prisoners of war. The the Vietnamese military advisor at the base had a special way of torturing those he captured, starvation. For several days, the wounded Benny and Grimm sat down there with nothing to eat, until one day the military advisor dropped the knife in the hole, telling Mr. Grimm that he can eat whatever he finds in the hole, implying that he should kill and eat his best friend Benny. Mr. Grimm understood what the advisor wanted him to do, but wouldn't give him the satisfaction. At first. With his wounds untreated, Benny died just a few days later. Desperate, Mr. Grimm begins to eat Benny. Afterwards, he sews the skull of his deceased friend into a helmet that he refuses to remove, and will become violent towards anyone who tries to force him to. Only two weeks later, the U.S. military arrived to rescue Mr. Grimm, and when they tried to take his skull helmet off, he killed four people before they brought him down. After that, they took Mr. Grimm back to the U.S. and put him in Blackfield Asylum with the rest of the contestants. Until one day when Calypso visits, giving him the chance to fulfill any wish he desires if he wins the tournament. He agrees. His wish? To get revenge on the Vietnamese military advisor who turned him into a monster and allowed his best friend to die. Mr. Grimm has a line in his story that serves as the de facto slogan statement for the game. They say the mind bends and twists in order to deal with the horrors of life. I think my mind bends so much it snapped in two. It's a phrase I'll be using quite a few times in this video. It even appears on the rear cover of the game's box. The way I see it, evil is this disease in the world of Twisted Metal Black. Passing through the streets of Midtown like a plague, it's this parasitic rot that spreads not from a cough or sneeze, but the dark tendrils of hate and violence and greed reaching out and corrupting whatever good it touches. The dark disease of evil passes from host to host, making monsters out of everyone. Every character in this game is either a victim of evil or the embodiment of it. Mr. Grimm is no exception. Just a kid out of high school told he must fight a ridiculous war, finds himself at the hands of unforgivable evil. Given no other choice, he chooses to let that evil infect him in order to survive. But he didn't really survive, did he? His flesh remains, but his mind, bending and twisting, thrashing and gnawing at the horrors life has thrown at it, perished in that hole alongside his best friend Benny. Whatever came out of that hole is no longer man as we understand, but a man-shaped vessel that evil has hollowed out and made its own. Another host for the dark disease whose only desire is to spread itself further and wider. When Mr. Grimm wins, he does not choose to bring his best friend back, but rather seeks vengeance on the person responsible for his suffering. Mr. Grimm wants revenge, not his best friend back and revenge he gets when he wins the tournament. Calypso provides him with a, quote, dinner for one, the Vietnamese military advisor. Mr. Grimm says as much as he doesn't like to admit it, he's developed a sort of special craving. The evil has come full circle and completely overcome Mr. Grimm, leading him to killing and eating the man who gave him the disease of evil. Eliminating the source doesn't stop the spread. It's just another twisted link in the chains that oppressed the world of Twisted Metal Black. I think that Mr. Grimm represents broadly the ideas of darkness and evil that Twisted Metal Black explores as a full package, instead of something in the mind of Sweet Tooth specifically. Anyways, on to John Doe. Let's face it, who wants to spend the rest of their life as a nobody? John Doe was the driver of Roadkill, a green muscle car draped in rust like an apocalyptic caramel apple. John Doe was a man without a past, or at least not one that he can remember. He finds himself in the Blackfield Asylum, locked away with the rest of the contestants. He has no idea who he is or where he came from. The closest thing he has to a clue are the tattoos that cover his body, most of which are not exactly comforting. John Doe was visited by Calypso one day, the way every contestant is in this game, and Calypso presents him with a picture of a clean-cut, well-groomed man, explaining to him that that's 
him, John Doe, and he has a whole pass just waiting for him, if only he competes and wins the tournament. Given no other option, John agrees to join the contest, and throughout the game, John Doe starts to have memories flooding back into his head. At one point, he remembers a gang that he was a part of that planned to destroy a disease control center, with hopes to earn the respect of the larger world by ushering along an apocalypse. When John Doe wins the tournament, he approaches Calypso to receive his prize, to remember who he is. Calypso simply tosses towards him a wallet, and inside was an FBI badge and a picture of John looking like a real somebody, a true professional. John then remembers that he was an agent undercover with the terrorist group, and their plan to blow up the disease research center was stopped only by his efforts. He ran back in just as the explosives they left were set to go off, and got them out of there before they could do any real damage. The explosion, though, knocked John unconscious and caused him to suffer from amnesia. When the authorities arrived, they found him and threw him in the Blackfield Asylum, where the FBI, I guess, never bothered to collect their man, who at that point was a hero. John has a career, a family, an identity that his good deed forced him to forget. He also remembers that he's an FBI agent who is standing next to number two on the FBI Most Wanted list, and Calypso simply can't have a badge cramping his style. Calypso just shoots him right there. That's it. That's where this ends. This is another story that I feel is kind of lacking the same depth that's present with many of the other characters, but it's still intriguing and well executed. John Doe could represent Sweet Tooth's relationship to the concept of identity. John Doe is a man who had a career, a family, a life to be proud of, but lost it all when he was undercover with a criminal organization, and events therein led to his memory getting destroyed in an explosion. Unable to remember who he is or where he came from, he became a blank slate whose history is irrelevant at best and dangerous at worst. Sweet Tooth could once have been a man with a career, a family, and a life to be proud of too, all until some horribly powerful event broke his mind and allowed the Needle's personality to split off and take control, like we talked about with the Billy Ray interpretation. When that happened, he strapped the mask onto his head and became a blank slate of his own, freeing himself from the bounds of his past life. The old Marcus is just dust and echoes now. Just as Calypso discarded John Doe, as soon as he realized who he truly is, for Needles to look back and try to find the old Marcus again would require Needles to cease as well, maybe. This one's a bit tough. Anyways, moving on to No Face. When the lights are low in this place, you get plenty of time for thinking. No Face is the driver of Crazy 8, an old-timey hot rod painted red and featuring the iconic 8 on each door. Crazy 8 was originally planned as Outlaw, the police car, but was changed to be a new vehicle altogether. No Face was formerly known as Frank the Tank McCutcheon, a small-time boxer in Midtown following in the footsteps of his father, who was once a famous prize fighter. Bout after bout, his dad would knock out opponents with ease and Frank had every reason to believe that he had that same blood of a champion flowing through his body. But unlike his father, No Face never contended for a national title, so Frank resigned himself to fighting for the love of the sport. No Face's fights would often go the distance, putting on a show that the fans loved. Frank's story begins when, one night, he had a fight scheduled against a boxer from out of town, Phil the Drill. The bookkeepers had Frank as a favorite versus the newcomer, but the odds fell quickly out of favor for No Face when the new fighter knocked him out before the first round was even over. Horribly injured, some guys at Frank's boxing gym recommended a surgeon who could help him get right. The doctor was even a big fan of the fights, and not having the means to find a more reputable medical professional, No Face had little choice but to give Dr. Hatch a try. However, it turns out the doctor was such a big fan of the fights that he had to decided to bet $20,000 on Frank, and of course, lost it all. As Frank was put under with anesthesia, he could only hear the scraping of the doctor's blades, put to the soundtrack of blaring opera music. When the doctor was finished, he had removed Frank's eyes and tongue, and stitched shut his eyelids and mouth, earning Frank the nickname, No Face. He claims the pain afterwards was so intense that it was like he went 15 rounds with a semi-truck. No Face then spent some amount of time sulking in an alleyway before deciding to rush back into the hospital looking for the doctor who did this to him, but instead ends up killing six people, none of which happened to be Dr. Hatch. It was then that No Face was admitted into Blackfield Asylum to wither away with the rest of the contestants. Sometime later, Calypso visits him and offers him a chance to get revenge on the man who ruined his face and stripped him of his identity. All he had to do was compete in Calypso's tournament. Identity is a tricky thing to nail down. I mean, what are we if not some collection of atoms and energy arranged in the shape of a person on a collection of atoms and energy arranged in the shape of a planet and so on? When we need ways to distinguish one group of atoms and energy from another, we provide names and descriptions of them. So when we need to identify one person from another, what do we say? Do we describe their appearance, their eyes and hair? Do we describe what they do, their work and hobbies? Do we describe what they are like, their personality or behavior? Frank became unrecognizable in every one of those aspects. 
His face was ruined. His ability to perform was thrown away with his face, and his personality was demented and corrupted by this disease of evil, finding his body as a worthwhile host after it was passed on by the doctor. Like the rest of the world in Twisted Metal Black, where good once stood, evil will take its place. The darkness makes its fill in an effortless instant. Evil is something that happens to you in the dark world, and good is just a placeholder while you wait for your turn. No Face got his turn. After winning the contest, No Face is presented with a doctor who took everything from him. This prize had a bonus thrown in. A boxing glove modified with the same blades and instruments used to disfigure him. All it took was a single punch to take care of the doctor, something he had never done before. Something his father did constantly. And, as it turns out, No Face had the blood of a champion in him all along. It just expressed itself in a way he didn't expect. He transitioned from the fledgling boxer stuck in the shadow of his dad's success to carving out his own identity, dark and monstrous as it may be. But at least it's all his own. He's the champion of Twisted Metal. The world of Twisted Metal Black is a forge with pitch black flames, tempering the steel of the wayward and lost souls into its own image, dark and evil. As for the interpretation, I'm just going to defer to the Twisted Metal wiki for this one. It says that No-Face could represent how Sweet Tooth sees the world, that all he sees is darkness, just as No-Face does. Makes sense to me, I guess. Moving on to Raven. Being unconscious is like being in a pitch black room with no doors, no lights, and no way out. I could have stayed in that place forever. Raven is the driver of Shadow, a purple hearse using the always classy and appropriate skeleton as a hood ornament. The hearse garnered the name Shadow due to the ghostly nature of its special attack, that sends some mysterious explosive orbs gliding across the ground as if being pulled along by dark, unknowable forces. Raven is no stranger to those dark, unknowable forces, the ones that surround and suffocate the world of Twisted Metal Black. Where others might resist or pretend they don't exist, she embraces the darkness, finds warmth in the abyss, and walks hand in hand with the lost souls that haunt her hearse and the streets of Bidtown. As a student of the occult, she is attuned to the supernatural, like a car radio making music from the static between stations. Her story begins when she was hanging out at the pier with her best friend and soulmate, Kelly. They were doing a tarot reading to see if the boy Kelly liked would ever notice her. The cards had a different story to tell though, because what she pulled out of the deck was the death card. It was then that a couple of bullies from the high school pulled up to the pier looking for Raven and Kelly. One bully held Raven down while the other picked up Kelly and dangled her over the pier, wondering aloud if witches could swim, while Raven shouted desperately that she didn't know how. Despite her pleading, they dropped Kelly into the water before running away, leaving only Raven to sit there helpless and frozen as her best friend drowns. The last words Raven could hear Kelly say were, you have to make them pay. The loss of her best friend sent Raven over the edge, so her parents admitted her into Blackfield Asylum, where she stayed for an unspecified amount of time, until Calypso visited her and gave her the chance to compete in his tournament for the prize of avenging Kelly. There are few things more beautiful than allowing yourself to believe that the world needs to only be as big as the space you share with the one you love, just as there are few things more devastating than realizing that sometimes we are powerless to the wills and whims of a mysterious and larger force. Raven got to experience all of that top to bottom with her relationship to Kelly, like a brilliant star collapsing into a black hole. She knew a flash of hope in a dark world that had no choice but to become just another example of its horror. And anyone with a basic understanding of tarot will tell you that the death card is not literal. The card is transition, it's change. The cards didn't tell the story that Kelly would be lost, but that Raven would be granted the catalyst she needed to not only avenge her best friend, but every other lost soul that the bitter, corrupted world of Twisted Metal Black has taken and torn apart. After winning the contest, Raven is given a pair of voodoo dolls by Calypso and is assured that all she has to do to avenge Kelly is use them. Raven swears that the first poke into the eyes of the voodoo dolls, she could feel something give. It took the police two days to find the bodies of the bullies who took Kelly's life. Their eyes were gouged and scratched out. It was then that Raven completed her transition, from helplessly watching the horrors of Midtown and Twisted Metal Black unfold around her, to becoming the sole warrior against it. Raven sets out to be a hero to the people of the dark world, using her voodoo dolls and haunted hearse to protect them. Our gothic teenage legend of Midtown, Raven, could represent Sweet distorted sense of morality, that the concepts of good and evil do exist, but that righting a wrong means adding more evil into the corrupted stew of black. In this world, revenge is the only answer to any problem. When Raven lost her best friend to the senseless evil that wafts around the world of black like a breeze, her wish wasn't to bring back her best friend, it was to be given the means to avenge her spirit. This is Needle's school of justice. Eye for an eye, until we all go dark. Next up is Dollface. Now that I think about it, Maybe it wasn't all my fault. 
Dollface is the driver of Darkseid, a large black semi-truck with a cop car haphazardly strapped to the front like a fanny pack. She came into the possession of the massive rig after she hitched a ride from its original owner and took it for herself. Dollface is a young woman who hails from a family of dysfunction and abuse. She was an only child whose parents worked 15 hours a day. At just 10 years old, her home life became even worse as her mother unexpectedly passed away. For years after her mother's death, she would occasionally hear her father mumble the words, it's all your fault. After college, she found a job working for a mask maker named Mr. Creel, and her new boss reminds her a lot of her father. Her age is unknown, but we can assume she is in her early to mid 20s given that she has been to college. In early versions of her design though, she was much younger and the victim of her abusive father. This was later changed by Sony for being a touch too dark even for a game as upsetting and disturbing as Black, although there are still some remnants of this original design in the final version, as the way she speaks is much closer to a young girl than a woman of college age. I was a bad girl one time, and now I'm going to pay for what I did forever and ever and ever. As Mr. Creel's new assistant, she wanted to do a good job, do as she is told and not defy her boss. But despite her best efforts, she couldn't help making a mistake. One day, she accidentally spills coffee on some important documents, which prompted Mr. Creel to punish her by locking her in a doll mask that cannot be removed unless a special key is used. Prior to the events of Twisted Metal Black, Dollface sits alone in her asylum cell, believing that she deserves to be condemned inside the mask, with her identity obscured and head crushed by unyielding porcelain. Calypso visits her at Blackfield, presenting her an opportunity to escape the mask, if only she competes and wins in his game. Dolph Dollface agrees, but not without questioning whether or not she deserves to be free. It's clear that Dollface has internalized all the abuse and trauma she has suffered and endured throughout her life. Her loading screen dialogue shows a woman on a journey of realizing that she is not to blame for her suffering, that it's the world around her that is full of monsters, not her. By the time she reaches the end of her story, she has become empowered to believe the truth. She is given the key to unlock her mask and be free, but it's attached to an Iron Maiden contraption that has Mr. Creel held inside. If she takes the key, Mr. Creel is crushed by the spiky interior of the Iron Maiden. At the start of her journey, she would never do that to her old boss. She believed that she was rightfully punished for not being careful, but after some introspection throughout the course of the game, she now knows that she's the victim, she's innocent, and she has a chance to remove him from the world and to keep him from hurting more people. She takes the key and the Iron Maiden crushes him. She decides to leave the mask on her face. Even though it hides her identity, she decides that she has the power to choose her own identity, and she chooses the mask. It doesn't cry or look scared, and no matter how old she gets, the mask will always look the same. With that done, she sets out to take down other people like Mr. Creel, before they can do to others what he did to her. What I think Dollface represents in the context of being within Needle's mind is how the horrors of black are inevitable. The only choice is what lemonade you make from the sinister citrus that falls from the black lemon tree. Dollface is a story where a young woman, innocent and pure, was the victim of an abusive boss and locked away behind a mask that hides who she is. Captive in her own body, the only face she can present the world is the one someone else forced upon her. But by the end, she embraces her new identity, even preferring it as it hides her pain, her fear, and her flaws. Dollface could be how Sweet Tooth believes that the world is a buzzsaw, and the only way to survive is to become one with the chaos and take the punches and scars in stride to fight back on its terms. Next up is Spectre. He said he knew where I could find my true love. How could I refuse an offer like that? Bloody Mary is the driver of Spectre. Her name is one that plays on her deadly obsession of finding hot singles in her area to get married to. She's been woefully unsuccessful to this point, but there are plenty of pigs in the slaughterhouse. She remains hopeful. She is the product of a horrifically toxic and abusive upbringing, full of bullies calling her a fat, ugly cow, and a father who constantly bombarded her with the idea that her value as a human is directly tied to how pretty she is. Also, he killed her mom, but she seems to be like fine with that, I guess. One day, she forgot to take her medication before attending her friend's wedding. One thing led to another, and she ended up in Blackfield Asylum with the rest of the unfortunate souls of Twisted Metal Black. Her first attempts at courting a crush were in grade school, when her efforts led to a boy saying, quote, I would never kiss you in a million years, you ugly, fat cow, before pushing her down into the mud. In early versions of her cutscene, she is shown beating him with a lead pipe, but this was cut for going a little bit too far. BM took that about as well as you would imagine. Mary has grown more more and more bitter that the world around her has access to love and affection while she's stuck on the outside waiting for her turn. During her middle cut scene, she reveals her violent episode at her friend's wedding and tells the story of her dragging her friend's quote, fat ugly body 
to the dressing room and putting on the wedding dress for herself. I don't know much about wedding dresses, but I do know that if anything, they are meticulously tailored to fit their wearer perfectly. So if Mary were to, say, put on the dress of her friend, who she just claimed was a fat, ugly cow, and the dress fits perfectly, I think that says a lot about where Mary's opinion of herself is at. Outwardly, she maintains that she is pretty and worthy of love and affection that the world refuses to give her. But inwardly, I don't think she believes that. Her father convinced her that the only way for her to be worthy of anything is to be pretty. But clearly, a very formative moment in her life was when a boy she liked shoved her to the ground and called her an ugly, fat cow when she approached him. So I think her mind is so twisted and broken that she actually believes that she is unworthy of love, affection, or any other meaningful human connection. Her friend throwing the traditional wedding bouquet towards her was not a well-wishing gesture from a friend. No, not to Mary. She took it as an act of mockery because a broken, shattered mind is like reverse alchemy, taking what's golden and bright and turning it into ash and sh**. Whatever thin thread was holding together her psyche, it gave out. When Calypso came to visit her in Blackfield Asylum, she was still wearing her friend's wedding dress as she sat in her cell alone and unloved. Calypso promised her true love if she wins the tournament, and upon the end of her story, she is granted her wish. Calypso presents her with a man that he claims will be her Prince Charming, but even though Calypso surgically altered the man's brain, he still could not bring himself to love BM. So she responds by killing the man with a club before running off to find someone that will love her, even if it takes going through every man on earth. My interpretation isn't that Calypso tricked her or that she is like so repulsive that no man could ever love her. It's that Calypso promised her true love, and I think that killing a man with a club is her true love. Our hopeless bachelorette, condemned to toil away in the harrowing depths of the perpetual swipe left, BM might represent Sweet Tooth's feeling towards both love and the various other drivers of Spectre throughout the series. The previous drivers of Spectre have all been shallow narcissists obsessed with seeking out fame and attention. Sweet Tooth could see the pursuit of celebrity as the same fruitless journey of finding romance or meaningful connection with another person. Sure, you might have it for a moment, but it's fleeting as you're always at the mercy of others to hold on to it. Sweet Tooth could believe that whether it's love or fame, it's all just a way to dress up the act of idly twiddling your thumbs while waiting for the anvil of betrayal trail and rejection to drop. Now, this is where we enter the region of characters that are considered more as bonuses to be unlocked rather than fully fledged stories with the beginning, middle, and end like the others. Not that there aren't interesting or worthwhile ideas on display with this group. They just literally don't have as much content as the main roster, so these will be kind of quick. Which brings us to Yellow Jacket. When I win this game, Calypso promises he'll make everything all better. Charlie Kane and Son are behind the wheel of Yellow Jacket as a horrific duo comprised of a savant child controlling his dead father like a f***ed up puppeteer of IR remote control. Before the events of Twisted Metal Black, things were perfect for Charlie Kane and his son. He drove a taxi cab and would bring his son along with him sometimes. But he wouldn't let him talk about his brother Needles, who would end up becoming a notorious ice cream killer that torments the city of Midtown. As for Charlie and his son, they were inseparable. And one fateful night, a passenger had a gun and shot Charlie before running away. The child, horrified by the loss of his father, had an idea. He would rig his father's body to be controlled by a remote control, and together they would take on the Twisted Metal Tournament, hoping that their prize could make things better, whether that means resurrecting Charlie Kane or otherwise. The child sees no other way forward than to compete and see what happens. Upon winning the tournament, Calypso, instead of granting the child what he wants, destroys a remote that controls Charlie, killing him permanently, before whisking the child away. Calypso tells the kid that he needs a successor, someone to run Twisted Metal when he can't any longer. His first choice would have been Needle's Cane, but a Yellow Jacket victory means every other competitor was vanquished, Sweet Tooth included. The next best thing is Needle's brother, the child, as violence is just in their blood. I think that the story here of Charlie Kane and his son could represent Sweet Tooth's relationship to his father, that Charlie is dead to him and it's only the inner child of Needles buried somewhere deep within his mind keeping the vague idea of his father alive. Yellow Jacket's ending could point to Needles finally snuffing out the last remaining memory of his father to fully convert every part of him to his disease of evil and take over Twisted Metal. And just like a little bonus tidbit, I'm not sure if it's worth pointing out, but Yellow Jacket is unlocked on the junkyard map by opening the sewer section and driving to the end where the car is waiting on a podium. Putting your father in a literal shit tunnel is a good way to say you are nothing to me. M moving on to Axel. It was him. That freak in the ice cream truck. He was always around the neighborhood. Axel's story begins where one day he was walking the park with his wife, the love of his life. He looks away for just a second and 
gone. He had no answers of what happened, but he knew it wasn't good. Three months after her disappearance, he began to receive pieces of his wife through the mail, taunting him, reminding him of his pain. Axel says it took eight months before all of her was returned. The dark disease, the mind-altering plague that pervades the world of Twisted Metal Black, had infected Axel in twisting and turning the knobs of his psyche. It convinced him to build an absurd two-wheeled contraption as a way to punish himself for allowing his wife to be taken from him. He believed fully that he had a penance to pay, and the only currency it was accepting was the shredding of his body and the loss of his freedom. The dark disease also gave him an idea that revenge was the only way to set things right, but he wasn't sure if he had the strength to confront his wife's murderer. Calypso in his contest offered to change all that. Upon winning the tournament, Axel was presented with Sweet Tooth. Even with the killer in front of him, Axel still couldn't help but blame himself. Sweet Tooth told him that his wife didn't die easy, that she was begging for him as he killed her. Axel shot Sweet Tooth, ending him. This did little to comfort Axel. All he could say was, the clown is dead, but so is my wife. I will never be free. The dark disease of Twisted Metal Black once again has converted a good man's desperation into another example of its darkness. Our man trapped between the two cartoonish wheels, Axel, represents the guilt and pain that Sweet Tooth possibly feels deep down for having ended his wife, like we talked about with the Billy Ray interpretation, that he let the quote clown take over his body, causing the floodgates of unspeakable horror to pour out in the form of Sweet Tooth. Axel says in the ending, quote, the clown is dead, but so is my wife, I will never be free, end quote, implying that some aspect of Sweet Tooth is still human enough to express guilt and regret. Warthog. Cage is the driver of Warthog, a civilian station wagon plopped on top of a modern battle tank chassis. Cage's whole motivation is that he wants to be an even more notorious and feared monster than Sweet Tooth, but has this problem where he feels remorse and sadness whenever he takes a life. His wish is to remove that part of his brain, the one that causes that remorse and sadness. Upon winning the tournament, Calypso not only does what he asks, but also gives him a brand new pair of scissor hands as a bonus. The story is a bit lacking in substance or any real story whatsoever, but the performance of Cage's dialogue is what sells the character. It's chilling to hear how excited he is to have his new hands. He gave me a new pair of hands. They would become my trademark. When I killed, everyone would know it was me. I interpret Cage as Sweet Tooth's representation of his rivals and anyone who tries to compete in his realm. Where others have to be augmented and changed to keep up, Sweet Tooth just is a remorseless, irreparable monster by nature. Next up, Manslaughter. In my last video, the one about Twisted Metal Mysteries, I covered Black and what I think his appearance could mean for the overall world of Twisted Metal, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll just go over how Black is depicted in Twisted Metal Black, without going too much into detail about my wacky theories. If you're curious what my conclusions were for Black, please go check out that video. Black is the driver of Manslaughter, a massive brown dump truck. Black is best described as a gimp suit demon whose sole motivation is to kill Calypso for reasons that are not very clear. His patient profile on the character selection screen provides no information and his loading screen dialogue is made up of mostly broken sentences that don't offer any answers. All it mentions is that he was created specifically with the goal of winning Twisted Metal, armed with only three lessons, how to eat, to it and to kill. When he finally gets to Calypso, his efforts to take him down were thwarted by some Looney Tunes BS. Rather than Calypso, Black was met with a bomb and a rude note. It wasn't enough to completely destroy Black, and we are left to assume the hunt continues. And we saved the big man for last, Sweet Tooth. Three months in the Needles Kane is a driver of Sweet Tooth, an ice cream truck whose tasty treats have long been vacated. Now lies in its freezers the victims of the infamous serial killer clown. Needles Kane is Midtown's most notorious and feared serial killer, wearing a deranged clown mask, a feverish entity thirsting for blood and chaos. He remains in the back of everyone's mind as they walk the streets. Any moment could be the one that he strikes. However, one day he was captured by the police, and it took the militarized helicopter Warhawk and its pilot Black Razor to finally bring down Sweet Tooth. After his arrest, he was sentenced to execution. At the time he was to be electrocuted, a preacher was brought into the room to try and save Needle's soul, but instead the preacher shouted to the Lord to cast a curse on Needles to burn forever in hell. But at that moment, Needle's head had burst into flames and he broke free from the restraints of the electric chair as four officers struggled to get him down before killing three of them 
in less than a minute. Needles puts his mask back on, and soon after, he is taken to Blackfield Asylum, where he awaits until he finds some way to break the preacher's curse on him. The pain of the flames grow more and more each day. He was visited by Calypso one day, who offered him a chance to release him from the curse. All he had to do was do what he does best, kill and destroy everything around him. As I've mentioned many times, Twisted Metal Black is a world overcome by a rushing torrent of evil that I call the Dark Disease. Like a sentient shadow, the Dark Disease spreads itself further and wider, with every bit of light and goodness it snuffs out. Whatever it fails to destroy outright is corrupted, twisted, and mangled until there's no choice but to carry the disease of evil and pass it on. Sweet Tooth is patient zero of this Dark Disease, this new Black Plague. This world takes place in his head and a world to fit his way has no other path but darkness. It's a world interpreted through the filter of the dark disease. Once he wins the tournament, he stands before Calypso, who offers him a vial of the preacher's blood, who cursed him to bear the flames of hell upon his own head. It comes with a catch, though. If he drinks from the vial, the curse will be lifted, but should he ever go back to his killing ways, the curse will return. It took all of 10 seconds to make his decision. He discarded the vial and killed Calypso, because the dark disease rips and swirls like a black hole hurricane through the world of black, and Sweet Tooth is its event horizon, where nothing can escape its grasp. Not good, nor light. All right, so that's every character from Twisted Metal Black broken down and analyzed to the best of my ability, both through the lens of them in themselves and the lens of the meta narrative that encompasses the dark, bitter world the game takes place in. Let me know what you think and who your favorite character is in the comments. Have a nice day.